Is it possible for the concepts of faith and science to coexist in the mind of a well-educated scientist or devout Christian? According to the Christian and the scientist, it is not. I'm a biology major here at Pepperdine, and even attending a small private Christian university, I have experienced a sort of bias among my professors, especially ones in my scientific classes, that lean towards a more um, scientific um, idea of the creation of the universe rather than a biblical one. Um, and I've seen this problem after doing some more research as much more severe in the public school system. And um, a, a continuation of this problem can lead to a com students compromising their faith in order to receive a higher education. So first, I want to introduce this problem and explain it a little bit further to you all. Next, I want to introduce three reasons as to why this problem does not have to exist. And last, I will implement a policy for you guys to involve yourselves in to step closer to a solution. So let me go on to explain the problem a little bit further. So this is a graph that sh it, uh, explains how education is shaping students' beliefs in God. This is um, derived from corner of church and state. The dark blue, blue line represents the percentage of students who believe in God, and it's based on their amount of education. So the, what, the people who believe the most in God are the ones who are the least educated, according to this graph. And then this is the opposite side of the spectrum. People who are coming from re religious backgrounds who believe in God, the majority, which is going to be this yellow line, are people who believe that God created humans in their present form. So that means the majority of people are just, the majority of people who believe in God are omitting the scientific um, discovery of evolution so that it doesn't compromise their faith. Um, this is, uh, this came from Gallup. So after sufficient research, I stand to confidently offer the perspective that science and faith can coexist um, due to three key reasons. The first is going to be that God could have easily included evolution in his plan. The second is going to be the existence of radical altruism. And the third is going to be that belief without evidence is considered as a virtue. So let me go on to my first point, which is going to be that God could have easily included evolution in his plan. Um, so most of these ideas that I've received are from watching uh, this Veritas Forum by Francis S. Collins. It is one of the most amazing speeches I've ever watched. I highly encourage you all to um, watch it. Um, so one of his points that he makes that I've kind of turned into my own is, what, what if God created the um, universe with its parameters precisely tuned to allow, the to allow the development of complexity over time? He could have started with the most minute organism and sculpted and molded it until he had perfected the human brain to then live out in his image. And with this perspective, we have to um, consider that time, that God is outside the realms of space and time. He's outside our, of our universe. So humans have created this time system, the days, the minutes, the hours, the weeks. God is outside of this time system, completely outside of our universe. So he could have activated evolution and um, taken maybe a second or a day to um, perfect humankind, but it could have been a million years on the planet Earth and within the time system that we have created for ourselves. Um, the second point is going to be the existence of radical altruism. I want to define a couple things first. So um, the first definition is going to be evolution. Evolution is just a change in genetic composition of a population over successive generations. So um, this is triggered by what's called natural selection. This is, um, this defines natural selection in simple terms. So within every species, there's variation. So we have a shorter neck giraffe with a longer neck giraffe. Same species of giraffe, just showing variation. Um, within these species, there's competitions for foods, food, mates, um, water, living areas. And in this species specifically, the longer neck giraffe is going to be a little bit more adapted to survive and reproduce because his longer neck allows him to reach food sources that are above the shorter neck giraffe's um, ability to reach. So ultimately, the longer neck giraffe will pass on his, or will reproduce more and be more fit, and then therefore pass on his genes to his offspring, who will also show, also show this beneficial variation. So something that's not present in the process of natural selection is going to be the trait of altruism. Altruism is um, practically just putting someone else's welfare above your own. So um, we don't see this in the animal kingdom. This is not a trait that is present. It is trait of trait that is present, however, in the human species, the only species that um, promotes this trait. So um, I got this idea of altruism from David Van Bima, David, David Van Bima um, in his Time article. So this is Officer Victor Ortiz. This is from CBS News New York. He is pulling a woman from a train track while a long, long coming train is coming to save her life at a risk of his own. This is an act of radical altruism that we will only see in the human species. Um, 
the only time we ever will see radical altruism in any other species is when a mother is or a father is protecting their cubs. Um, but this is ultimately going to increase the mother's reproductive fitness by um, saving a, her own lifeline. So um, before I go into the third point, which is going to be that belief without evidence is a virtue, I want to address some refutations to this idea. Um, so this is Jerry A. a. Cohn's book, Faith Versus Fact. I read about it and got a synopsis from the Washington Post. Um, it pretty much discusses how faith and science cannot coexist because of the disconnect between Genesis and evolution, so the biblical and the scientific creation stories. Um, I did a little bit more research to see if there were some reputations to this book. And we see a quote from Can Faith and Science Coexist, the American Science Blog Network. And it says that anti-religion scientists have overstated science's power to answer all the questions or solve all the secrets of the universe. And this is true because if we leave um, all the unanswered questions for science to solve, we're just gonna be left with a whole bunch of unanswered questions. Um, I wanna kind of review his book in my own terms as well. This is um, what the prophets that were writing Genesis, this is their idea of what the world looked like at the time. So their scientific understanding of the world. Um, it's a flat world with holes right here to let in the oceans, um, rivers, and lakes. They erupt out of the holes at the bottom of the flat earth. There's water surrounding it. We have a firmament for a sky right here that has floodgates that let down the rain. And um, we also have the cosmos, which are the sun, moon, and stars, all within this firmament. Um, so we see that, yes, there is a disconnect between um, Genesis 1 and evolution, but that's because the Genesis 1 is not attempting, their, their intention is not to give us a scientific understanding or um, explanation of how the world came to be because they had no scientific knowledge of what was going on. So um, their only intention was to show how God uh, is related to the creation of mankind. Uh, so this brings me to my third point. It's going to be about how belief about evidence is a virtue. I got this quote from Taking Science on Faith, and it says, in science, a healthy skepticism is a professional necessity, whereas in religion, having belief without evidence is considered a virtue. So in science, we want to have a hypothesis and then test it a million times until we can prove it to be true or prove it to be a theory. Whereas in faith, we want to have sort of a blind faith because God doesn't want us to, God doesn't want to be proven so that we are forced to believe in him. He wants us to be something that we must seek to understand. Um, so, it is not God's purpose to make his intention absolutely obvious to us. If it suits him to be a deity that we must seek without being forced to, would it not have been sensible for him to use the mechanism of evolution without posting obvious road signs for his role in creation? So, just to recap, I have talked about how um, the problem of education, of our education system, within the realms of faith and science coexisting, especially in a scientific classroom. I've also addressed three reasons as to why this doesn't have to be a problem. The first is that God could have included evolution in his plan. The second is the existence of radical altruism. And the third is that having belief without, without evidence is a virtue. And now I plan on uh, discussing this topic further by inviting you all to sign the petition that I will pass around after this speech for you all to sign. I can then take it to the, co the convocation office and hopefully get this topic passed so that we can all sit down together and discuss these topics and especially talk about if you feel as if your faith has been compromised in a classroom here at Pepperdine or in any other educational setting that you've had before. The compellingtruth.org said it best. Science tells us how we work while faith tells us that we have work.